morning. Here are yet again for another lovely session of CENG 3325 Structural Analysis. It's going to be the 10th lecture in the video series, and today we're going to continue on with the discussion of shear and bending moment diagrams for beams. So previously we looked at how to find shear and bending moment diagrams for, um, for beams using the method of sections. And we looked at how to do that both at an individual point and also as a function of x. And we did hint at there being some integral and differential relationships between um, shear and moment. So today, I want to look at how to solve these explicitly using um, terms from calculus. So relationship between uh, load, shear, and moment. Uh, between load, shear, and moment. between load, shear, and moment. <coughs> All right, so uh, if you're not familiar with these, the basic idea between load, shear, oh, to, the basic idea of how to relate between load, shear, and moment is, it, as, is as follows. Uh, we can say that shear is equal, the shear, shear as a function of x is equal to the negative integral of w of x, or the integral of negative w of x dx. Or we can also say that uh, load, and w of x is going to be our load as a function of x, our distributed load as a function of x, or w of x is equal to negative uh, dv of x uh, dx. And then we also have moment. Moment as a function of x is equal to the integral of v of x, or the integral of shear of x. Uh, dx, or we can also consider the, the differential relationship where v as a function of x is equal to the differential uh, or the derivative of moment as a function of x. Uh, now, I would like to give a note on um, uh, signs, on sign convention. People often get confused by this uh, negative on the shear, and really that's just to take into account our um, our standard sign convention for shear and moment and load. Uh, generally, we consider, so note on signs. Uh, generally, we consider downward loads to be positive. So we, in other words, W of X is assumed down. And so um, here, and basically what this does is that this produces, this negative is necessary uh, to assure positive bending or positive bending moment. Uh, to produce, to mathematically produce, or to assure a positive bending moment with a downward load. With a downward positive load. Uh, when you start working through these integral relationships, this is so, that's something that always trips people up. And again, the reason for that is because if you just if you define uh, when you first write the w, it's tempting to say, okay, well, w is going downward, so it must be negative. And then you try to integrate that twice, and you'll end up with a negative moment. But then that doesn't jive with what you've learned uh, or been taught how a uh, you know a, a downward curving beam should be positive moment. And it's 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 a it's a source of uh, confusion and common clash. So uh, don't think too hard about it. Don't worry too much about it. There is, it's just a simple uh, negative to make the numbers uh, work out. Okay. Also, I want to tell, I want to get, uh, to discuss a bit about, um, again, going into some fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, shear and moment and the fundamental theorem of calculus is another thing I want to consider here. Uh, shear and moment and the fundamental theorem of calculus. Shear 
So shear and moment and the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, it's very tempting to say that shear is the, the integral of uh, load and that moment is the integral of shear. But really, is that truly correct? No, it's really not correct. The integral of shear or the, or the integral of load does not give you the value of the shear. And same thing for, uh, same from shear to moment. What does it give you? Any idea? Well, it gives you a function, yes, that's true. But truth be told, the integral gives you the change. The integral of, uh, in, in turn, or instead, the integral of load over a length, or over an interval, the integral of load over an interval gives the change in shear. The integral of shear over an interval, uh, the shear integral over an area an interval gives the change in moment. So it is a bit of a misnomer to say that the integral of shear is moment and the integral of load is, uh, is shear. In truth, you're, when you take an integral, you're getting a, a change. And really, the reason for that is that if you, um, the source of this is really comes back to calculus. So if you have some w of x, and if you take the integral of it, if you take the indefinite integral of it, you're going to end up with some sort of function. But what else are you going to have? Constant. You're always going to have that constant. And that constant cannot be produced by the integral alone. We're going to need some sort of boundary condition. You're always going to need some sort of boundary condition to find the actual value of the function. So in turn, another way of thinking of this is mathematic. If I write this, if I write what I already have here out mathematically, I can see that uh, the integral, the negative integral of w of x on an integral from a to b dx is actually equal to what? It's not equal to v of x, but it's really equal to v at b minus v at a. It's the change in shear. Uh, in turn, for shear, the integral from a to b of v of x dx is equal to m of b minus m of a. Yes. Yes. No, I mean the integral of the load is equal to the shear. The integral of the shear is equal to the load. Oh, sorry, the integral of the load, you're getting me caught in uh, circles here. The integral of the load is equal to the shear. The integral of the shear is equal to the moment. The integral of the load is equal to the shear. The integral of the shear is equal to the moment. Okay. I think what the source of confusion here was I wrote uh, this one. I, wrote, I reversed the order here. I flipped the equation. Okay. Uh, so, but now, um, if we want to, but of course we know from calculus that the, that the derivative does, in fact, give us the actual value. So the derivatives do give us the precise value. Uh, precise functions and values Uh, no boundary condition needed, of course. Okay. So I want uh, now I can show you all, I can show all of you the formulas here, show you all the theorems, but I think it might be easiest to show this as an example. Okay. 
So I'm going to move on to working through an example of shear and bending moment uh, functions by integration. So let us consider this example here. So um, let us consider a simply supported beam with the following load function. Well, actually, I'm not going to give us the function. I'm going to have us develop the function. And often that can be the tricky part, just get, especially if the function is more complex. One year I had fun in an exam by giving the students a sinusoidal load function. A sinusoidal load, load function. You don't know what that is? Like four times, uh, it was like W of X equals four times the sine of two X or something like that. Or ooh, we could have something that requires the method of parts, integration by parts to be, oh, so much fun. Uh, anyway, let's say the upper load here is four kips per foot. And then uh, let's say uh, we have a beam length of 18 feet. Have a beam length of 18 feet. Of 18 feet here. And uh, this will have reactions. Oh, let me define points A and B. And we have reactions A, Y, and B, Y. I'll go ahead and neglect A, X because it's obviously zero. A, Y, and B, Y. All right, so um, first we'll go ahead and get the reactions, save a little time by getting the reactions. If you uh, get reactions, so, oh, actually fine, I should also say find V and M functions. So what I would like for this beam is an expression uh, for the shear and moment as a function of x. I want to know the shear and moment as a function of x. I'm given uh, this load diagram here and the dimensions of the beam and its support conditions, and I want to know the V and M functions. So a solution. <coughs> okay. Well, the first step is going to be to uh, find the reactions. And I think you know how to do that, that at this point, so I'm just going give to them, give them to us. And I can, I can find by summing moments and summing forces in the vertical direction that by is equal to 12 kips upward and ay is equal to 24 kips upward. <coughs> that ay is equal to 24 kips upward. <coughs> okay. Uh, two, my second step, is going to be to develop my load function. Develop my load function W of X. So I want W of X. Now, how can I get this function? How can I get this function? I need something. So I know that W of X is four kips per foot at the left end when X equals zero. Uh, 9.30? Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway. Uh, so, uh, let's say that I want to get a function for W of X, uh, for load, as a function of X. I, ha I know that on this end of the beam, the load is 4, 4 kips per foot, and I know at this end of the beam, the load is uh, 0. So fundamentally what this represents is I have two known points. I have 0 and 4, and 4, or, and, uh, sorry, 18 and 0. How do I find a function between them? Yes, remember, I, I know you all took algebra way back in the day, so I trust you all remember algebra, and uh, remember y equals mx plus b. y equals mx plus b. Oh boy. So the slope m, that's, slope is rise over run. 
Or you can do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Oh boy. Um, so the slope is going to be ne negative 4 gives per foot. Uh, divided by 18 feet. And we'll have a very interesting unit for our slope. And that's going to be negative 2 over 9 uh, kips per foot squared, or kips per foot per foot. Isn't that lovely? And then the intercept, well, this is easy. The intercept is, uh, that's going to be your B. Slope is uh, M. Intercept is B. And that's going to be 4 kips per foot. And so you put these two together. And we will get a final W as a function of X equal to 4 minus 2 ninths X. And now we have something that we can actually integrate. Now, looking at what we've learned previously, uh, how many zones of, in of integration am I going to need? Two. One. one. I'm only going to need one zone of integration. Why is that? Because I have two discontinuities. Yes, I only need one zone of integration because I have two discontinuities. I have discontinuity on the left end where the beam ends and where a point load is. And I have discontinuity on the right end where the beam ends and a point load begins. Or point load is. Uh, no, point loads don't really begin. Um, so uh, because of that, I, the, the whole load is one continuous function. I don't need to break it up into multiple zones. So I can get by with a single uh, zone of integration. It's almost like this example is chosen to demonstrate a, a concept. Okay, so the next step is going to be to develop the shear function. But we will go on to discuss how you do handle when, uh, if you have multiple zones of integration. Okay, so uh, let us look at the shear function next. And the shear function. So we, of course, know that, del that V of X, shear as a function of X, is equal to the integral of negative w of x dx, or if you prefer negative w of x dx, or a negative integral of w of x dx, uh, doesn't matter, of course. So then v of x, if I substitute in my load function, is equal to the integral of negative 4 minus 2 ninths x dx. Um, and then if you take the integral, again, just integral of a polynomial, I trust you can do this by now, x squared over 9, uh, minus 4x, minus 4x. You done? Yes. Absolutely. Plus c. Yes, it's always the plus c. Yes, the bane of every freshman calculus student uh, from now on uh, to, uh, to the beginning of time and probably till the end of time. It's always the plus c. It's always on that first integral exam. It's always that stupid plus c. Every time. Anyway, <laughs> plus c. Now, um, this is going to be a little bit different, though, because we have, um, because we're going to do more than one integration on these, and especially when we get to uh, later uh, in a week or two, when we get, oh, well, maybe, well, anyway, later in the course, when we get to integrating for deflection, we'll, ha we'll be integrating the same function four times. So I usually number these. I label them, uh, I usually just call the first one C1. So we'll add little subscripts to integrate, or to, inti well, to integrate, uh, to indicate, which is constant integration. Got to don't want to confuse integrate with indicate. Uh, so in to indicate which constants of uh, that we're using to integrate. There you go. I'm a poet and I didn't even know it. So um, here, now how can we get a boundary condition? We need some sort of boundary condition. So again, uh, when integrating things, if you want to get, if we if we borrow terms from calculus again, if we go back to our calculus, uh, if you want to solve for the constant, you need to have some sort of boundary condition. So I want some sort of boundary condition, a boundary condition. And what is a boundary condition? Well, a boundary condition, of course, is a point where the function's value is known. And how can I look at this and get a value for the boundary condition? Maybe I'll put in parentheses, sometimes I abbreviate this BC for boundary condition. Uh, how can I get this? How can I know what I, how can I find what a known value might be? Any thoughts? The reaction at A, yes. I know that immediately at A, the reaction is going to uh, is going to jump up by a positive, uh, well, I guess 24 kips. I know that it's going to jump up by a positive 24 kips um, before the first bit of load is applied. We know this from our experience past with shear and moment diagrams. So I know 
that uh, the shear, my one boundary condition, is that V at X equals zero is equal to 24 kips. That is a boundary condition. Or in turn, another one I could use is I know that at, uh, I know that at uh, 18 feet, the shear must be equal to negative 18 kips. Because basically, as every, you know, we've seen enough beams, we've done shear and bending moment diagrams enough times. Again, I am assuming this is not the first time you've seen shear and, shear and bending moment diagrams. Uh, you should have seen it in statics and also mechanics and materials. So we're going through this in more of a higher order, hopefully. And uh, so when we look at shear and bending moment diagrams, I would expect that uh, initially this would jump up to positive 18, then the load would cause it to decrease, pass through zero at some point, and then we'll end up with a shear of negative 18 on the far right end. So we could also use V at X equals 18 is equal to, oh, I'm sorry, not 18, uh, equal to uh, negative 12, I should say. So we could either use uh, X e V at X equals zero is 24, or V at X equals zero is equal to negative 12. Either one of those would work, but one of them is certainly more convenient. Uh, we have a polynomial, so I'm going to take the easy way out and say, you know what, I'd rather go with the term that's going to, I'd rather go with the, uh, the x equals zero because that this term and this term will drop away, and I am nothing if not incredibly lazy. So uh, v at zero is equal to zero minus zero uh, plus c1, or c1, and that is equal to 24 kips. And that leads us to that C1 is equal to 24 kips. Not too bad. So now we know that shear as a function of x for this beam is equal to x squared over 9 minus 4x uh, plus 24. And this would be in kips. And this would be in kips. Okay, uh, so next, what's my next step? <coughs> get the moment. I want to get the moment. I have the shear function. Now I want to get the moment. So for, I want to get the moment function. And this is going to be fairly straightforward. Well, if you consider a bending beam straight, but... Uh, <laughs> Moment function uh, so m as a function of x is equal to the integral of v as a function of x dx. Uh, and then this is equal to the integral of x squared over 9 minus 4x plus 24 dx. And I remember my calculus, so I know this is x to the uh, x cubed over 27 minus 2x squared plus 24x, yay, integrating polynomials, uh, plus c2. Now, I need a boundary condition. What boundary condition might I use? So I need to go back to my beam. I need to take a look at that and think, what boundary condition might I use? So again, we're looking for a point where I know where the moment, is, or where I know where the moment is. I need a, a point of known moment. Hmm. Looking at this here, how might I get that? Looking at that beam, do we have a point of known moment? Yes, where? Both supports. Uh, what is it? Infinite? Are you sure it's not infinity? I do like infinite. I do like infinite moment. Are you sure it's not infinite? How about one? One's a good number. Oh, from what I've taught me, there's zero. Okay, that's I was, probably wasn't lying to you. So, um, anyway, <laughs> probably, uh, but uh, that would infinite moment would be quite scary if, if quite interesting. Um, so, uh, no, it definitely isn't infinite. We know that the boundary condition, uh, backing up, <coughs> if, uh, if you have a pin or a roller support uh, at the end of a beam, we know that the moment there is going to be equal to zero. So, if you have a pin or a roller at the end of the beam we know that moment there is going to be equal to zero. So again, at x equals zero, m, and again, I could use the one at 18 feet, but again, I'm lazy, so I'm gonna use the uh, at moment at x equals zero is equal to zero, and that's a nice lazy solution. So, subbing in that known value, substituting in that known value, m at zero is equal to zero minus zero plus zero 
plus C2 is equal to zero. And what do you know? That leads to C2 is equal to zero. Big surprise. So M is a function of X then is equal to X cubed divided by 27 minus 2X squared plus 24X and this will be in kip feet. All right. All right, so, and now I have a simple function, uh, a simple polynomial where I can put in any value of x and I'll have the shear and moment there. Questions on this so far? Okay, so I've actually completed the steps of the problem or the requested information for the problem. I think I'll just go ahead and graph the results. Step five, graph results. And like I've mentioned before, I do like to go ahead and put them all uh, above each other for, uh, so we can see the mathematical relationships. So I'm going to put, uh, let's say my W of X here. I'm gonna have, um, this would be in kip feet, or sorry, kips per foot. Then below that, I'm gonna have my shear, my V of X, which will be in uh, kips. And then below that, I'll have my moment, which will be in kip feet. Which will be in kip feet. All right, so I'm gonna draw this here. Nice, perfectly linear, perfectly straight equation. Eh, I've drawn worse. So I'll basically just draw a free body diagram here. I have 24 kips, my reactions of 24 kips, and 12 kips, <coughs> and then also uh, four kips per foot. Uh, four kips per foot. Then I will draw my uh, shear here, and I'll have negative 12, down here and 24 up here, and I will draw this as parabolic. And if I wanted to, I could solve for the point of where that's equal to zero. Um, so this would be a positive shear here and negative shear here. Now, um, I might want to integrate, the, I want, might want to indicate that this is parabolic. So maybe I can put a little P here for parabola, if I wish. Now, um, I do want to discuss a bit about the slope of this thing. So here is a question. I could have drawn this parabola two ways. There are fundamentally two ways I could draw this. I could draw this as either concave up or concave down. How did I know which way to do it? No, but, huh? Function was positive. Uh, a sec, uh, well, sort of. Um, one way to think of this based on the second derivative effectively, yes. So, well, not quite, because I'm not taking the second derivative of this. Really what I'm looking at here, um, again, we know that, uh, what is the relationship between sh uh, load and shear? Load is the what of shear? Load is the derivative of shear. Load is the derivative of shear. So what that means is that the load is the slope of shear. Load is the slope of shear. So, in other words, here I have load value of, a load value of zero, which means the shear should have a slope of zero. Here, my value of load is at a maximum, which means my shear's slope here should be at a maximum. So that means I need to start with a steep slope and decrease uh, down to zero. Well, I guess I would, mathematically we could say it's increasing, <laughs> the slope is increasing to zero, but uh, eh, six one half does the other because um, of that negative. So that means this is concave up, at least the shear function is concave up. Now, in turn, I know that my, uh, I might drag a point down here because uh, that, it, that zero, or whatever that point is, that's gonna tell me something about the moment. What's that gonna tell me? That's gonna be the maximum, yes. We know that shear is gonna be equal to the max, or shear is equal to the derivative 
of moment. So that means where the shear is, uh, equal, the slope of the shear is equal to zero, where it has a horizontal tangent, or sorry, that where the uh, shear is equal to zero, that's where the moment will have a horizontal tangent. Or, or, or in other words, we'll have a local max or local min. And for this particular one, I know that it's only going to have one um, max value. Um, so that, that point of zero slope must be a max. And so then my moment is going to look something like this here. If I plot the function, it ends up looking something like this here. Basically, this is a, uh, now this, I know this looks like a parabola, but this is effectively a piece of a cubic function. So I might even put a little C there for cubic function. This is a piece of a cubic function. And this would be where my m max is. So if I plotted the whole equation, I would get something kind of like this or something. That, of course, the function only has any mathematical validity or any uh, real validity for, uh, the, it's only defined for when x is between 0 and 18 feet. Okay, um, other notes on this. Okay, so we do have a few other notes on this I want to discuss. All right, other notes here. Uh, you do still have to keep the origin constant. And you still have to write... Uh, still have to write new equations for every time the load changes. So every time the load changes, you're going to have to write a new set of equations. And also, we have a new, we'll have new boundary conditions. We'll have new boundary conditions each time. And also, we want to keep the x origin the same. Or origin, yes. Keep the x origin the same. So I want to keep the x origin the same, just like we did for uh, solving for a method of sections as a function of x. Uh, and but as every but each time I integrate, I'm going to need new boundary conditions. Now that's fine if you now uh, uh, now uh, think. Okay, let's maybe I'll draw this out. Uh, I'll, I want to do a slide on boundary conditions next. I think that this is worthy of some explanation. Okay, let's discuss boundary conditions. Uh, boundary conditions for multiple zones of integration. So the simplest case, um, the simplest case where you'd still have multiple zones would be where you have two zones. Two zones, it's still going to be fairly simple. You can often just use left and right end of beam. Uh, depending, of course, depending on how the beam is supported. If it has, a, if you had a cantilevered beam, you probably couldn't do that. But uh, but something like this here, especially a simply supported beam. If I have uh, something like this, if I have a a load like this, maybe here it's rectangular for one portion of the beam, and then after that it's triangular or linear, depending on your perspective. This would be fairly straightforward. All I would do is I would solve for the integration of each of these, and then I could just use the reactions on the left end for the boundary condition of this end of the beam, and I could use the reaction on this end of the beam for this, uh, so you get the constants for this end. Again, it would be fairly straightforward. It wouldn't be too bad. But where it gets more complex is where you have many zones of integration. So what if I had three or more? This is where it gets fun. What if you have three or more zones? Let's say you have something like this. And again, two or three depends on, when I say uh, uh, two or three, I'm assuming simply supported, but especially if you had something like a cantilever, even two zones of integration require doing this advanced method here. 
and advanced is a uh, it's, it's that's not it's not really that difficult it's just a uh, something that does bear, bear some explanation though frequent point of confusion so imagine I had something like this maybe I had a distributed load here oh I could have a point load here and then just for fun maybe I could have a, a linear load here How do I get this? So how many zones of integration am I going to have? I've heard five and four, maybe three. One, two, three, four. Four zones of integration. Again, I have boundary conditions wherever load start or stop or the beam does. Uh, where a point load is, and that will, that produces, in this case, that produces four zones of integration. So for this zone and for this zone, for boundary conditions, I can use the left and right end of the beam. Assuming I just solve for the reactions right off the bat, that can be done with simple statics. That's uh, free body, uh, rigid, by, uh, rigid body statics. Very easy. Just set up a free body diagram. Uh, do a balance of moments. Uh, you can get the reactions. Uh, well, maybe a little, it'll involve a little bit of math, but uh, fairly simple. But what about the middle two zones? How do I get the shear and moment there? What do I use for the boundary conditions there? What could I use for the boundary conditions? <coughs> the previous boundary conditions? Actually, no, we can't really do that. Um, the reason we can't, the, the suggestion was, why don't we just use the previous boundary conditions? Uh, and it's tempting. It's tempting to say, oh, if we know the shear at x equals zero is 24 feet, or is, is 24 kips or something, it's tempting just to plug that into this function here. The problem with that is that this function is only valid on this zone. And we'll have a shear function here that is only valid for that zone. And so uh, we can't, and so that boundary condition is only going to be valid if the function is valid in that point. So we can't use a boundary condition outside of where the, the, the load and the shear and the moment functions themselves are valid. We have to use a boundary condition from somewhere within that zone. How can we do that? Huh? How can we, f we need a boundary condition. Again, your boundary condition uh, must come from an x value in the zone. How can we get that? And at first it seems like it's, ho is, it, is it hopeless? Do we just give up and go home? No, we don't do that. I mean, definitely not here. Uh, this is structural analysis. Maybe we do that in statics class, but we don't do that here. Um, so uh, we don't give up and go home. No, what we do is we say, okay, uh, we still know calculus. We still know algebra. We still know that this can be mathematically solved. And more importantly, I know that my functions should be compatible. In other words, I'm going to have, at the end of the day, what I'm trying to get is some sort of function that shows, uh, you know, something like a V1 of x from x equals something 0 to a and then a v2 of x from x equals um, a to b that kind of thing we're looking for a piecewise function that will produce a that'll have a um, that'll be compatible but in terms that that'll describe the shear and the beam now we also know in turn that as long as there are no uh, point loads as long as there are no point loads or point moments, the, uh, the shear is not going to rapidly change. In other words, yes, if I put a point load here, like here there's going to be a sharp uh, drop in the shear function. But here there's no sharp, uh, I'm not applying a great big uh, amount of shear or point load right at one location. So instead, I know um, that the, uh, I know that the shear value, uh, if I, in other words, if I plug in, if this is, you know, a feet or eight feet, say, say it's eight feet from here to here. If I plug in eight feet into this function, I should get the exact same value as if when I put in eight feet in this function, shouldn't I? I know that. If I put in eight feet in this function, I should put in eight, I should get the same exact value as if I put in eight feet at this function. They should be compatible. The only way that wouldn't be true uh, is where you have a point load like that, because point loads do cause sudden uh, jumps in the shear and moment, or in the in the shear function, so in turn, uh, I can use for the interior regions. Uh, 
uh, you use the previous, the end conditions, the end values of the previous zone of integration as boundary conditions. Uh, integration as boundary conditions. So we use the end values. So in other words, again, if I already have, I, I might get this entire function uh, in zone one here just by doing an integral of the shear, uh, of sorry, of the um, of the load function here. And then if I want to get the end value, um, if I want to, if I need a boundary condition, I simply put, I simply take the shear function I already have from this part, substitute in the appropriate x value, and then I can get a shear value, and I'll plug that into the equation uh, for here as a new boundary condition. So, and you just kind of work your way down. Yes, yeah, so you can just work your way down. It's fairly straightforward after that. So you just work your way down, and really, hopefully, it isn't too bad. Okay, questions on that? Okay, any questions on that? All right, so I think I might cut this off here for this part of the lecture. And that'll do it for today. Thank you for watching, and as always, thank you.